Fantastic. So uh, we are live and um, we are privileged to have Jeff Parker here today. He's going to talk to us about um, platforms and, and the platform revolution. So uh, I think it would be helpful, Jeff, just to uh, have a little bit of background um, on you and, uh, you know, what you do all day apart from write books. And, and then we'll move on with the, the content. Sure, Jonathan. So first of all, thank you so much for having me here. Um, this is a lot of fun. I love doing these kind of things. Um, so let's see, I, I wear a lot of different hats, but my day job is uh, as professor of engineering at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. Um, but I, I sit on the intersection of, of engineering business and economics. Um, so I direct our Master of Engineering Management program, which we offer in conjunction with the business school at Dartmouth. Um, I spend my summers uh, at MIT at the Initiative on the Digital Economy, um, and that's through the business school. So I have an office there and, and work with a, a team of people um, primarily doing research work. Uh, have been really fortunate to be able to live on that intersection um, for decades. Uh, I did an undergrad degree in, uh, in engineering, did a PhD in business, and then ended up back in engineering uh, and worked at a business school for almost 20 years. And now I'm in an engineering school. And, and I, I think that's important. Um, I mean, I think it's fun because a lot of, but the importance comes because I think a lot of the um, progress and challenges that we're facing sort of in business and in society are at that intersection where things like regulation, governance, economics, and progress and technology are sort of meeting and lots and lots of things change as a result. So quick background. Well, that's fantastic. And I hope we're going to get on to some of that, especially as regards with uh, 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 as regards to regulation, so let's go back to basics and uh, let me start with a question you must have answered hundreds of times, uh, but I think it'd be great for us to have a refresher. Um, what is a platform, and, and what distinguishes it from other businesses? Is everything a platform? Nothing. It'd be great to hear. Yeah, so that's <laughs> it's almost a, a tough word that we hit upon mm. because the types of platforms that I study and, and, and think about a lot are ones that have strong network effects. And by network effects, I mean the value to any particular user is not only a function of the value of the system, the service, or the product, but also the number of other users, either of the same type um, or of some other type. So for example, if I was a, going to buy a computer gaming console, you know, I'd want to have other people to play games with if in some sort of multiplayer world. Um, so that would be a same side network effect. And I'd also care mightily about the, the number of developers that were creating content and new games. And that'd be a cross side network effect. So those businesses are, are pretty complicated. Um, and we've spent literally a couple of decades kind of working through the theory um, working through a lot of how you do pricing, um, how you sort of manage the early stage and then manage growth and then manage maturity um, as an organization. And so when we talk about platforms, that's what we're talking about is ones that have these network effects. Um, and, and it's important to say that because the word platform gets used kind of across the board for lots of different things. You know, they'll say, oh, well, I'm going to create a new car. And so we'll have a platform and off that platform, I'll get a, a four door sedan, a two door, you know, coupe and a, and a small sport utility vehicle. And that'll all be on the engineering platform. Um, so ours is a bit narrower in definition. And by that platform in our definition, we mean kind of uh, both systems and rules and architecture that allow for users to interact with one another and exchange something of value. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and I guess an adjacent sort of um, issue, um, if I could uh, play devil's advocate for a moment, is, uh, well, okay, there's, there's this new word platforms that everyone's using, but uh, we know our business. Um, it's not something we need to pay attention to. We'll just get on with our traditional business. I think I've read somewhere that you, you say now that every business uh, needs a platform strategy at least. If they're not going to be the platform, they need some way of interacting. What, what, why is it so essential for a business to have a platform strategy nowadays? Yeah, and, and by a platform strategy, as you say, I don't 
mean to say that every business is going to be a platform because in fact, most of them won't. Um, what we mean by that is every business is likely to be impacted by platforms. And mm -hmm. you can see that in sort of the dramatic growth of the world's largest. So think Alibaba, Tencent, Amazon, Google, et cetera. And those companies have become enormously powerful over the last you know, 10 or 15 years. And as a result, they're starting to impact traditional markets. So think banking, you know, think manufacturing, think healthcare um, for lots of reasons. Either they're going to directly enter markets or they'll be providing technology and solutions and artificial intelligence and machine learning tools um, that will get used. And so if you're not, uh, if you don't understand those businesses and what sort of how they operate, how they earn revenues, what their business model is, that's problematic because you need to understand sort of what they're likely to do and how you might interact with them as a business. So that's what we mean by you need a, a platform business you know, strategy. And, and some firms will be able to be platforms in and of their own right. So mm. can, I was, I was going to ask, um, can you, would you cite any particular examples of companies that have very successfully turned themselves from non-platform businesses into, um, you know, successful uh, platform businesses? Yeah. So, and I think there, the distinction is kind of between the, the digital natives, if you will, and then kind of traditional firms. Um, there are fewer examples of traditional firms, but uh, I'd say a lot of what we learned in terms of the theory and how these things work comes out of the software industry. And really, you can go back to the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Um, think back to the IBM Amdahl era for their 360, 370 system and how they were very vertically integrated. And I'm talking about IBM now. Um, and then over time, that opened up a bit and they had Amdahl come in. But you had a lot of verticals in the early days of the computer industry. Um, and what ended up happening is that got broken apart. And then you had a lot of horizontal layers. So you had sort of hardware systems and you had software systems. And it ended up being the software that really was the backbone um, because you were mediating between kind of end users, if you will, and then content creators. And those content creators could literally be content like you know, sort of media, mm. you know, music, television, video, but also content in the terms of, of software applications that would do something. Um, and, and it became clear that no firm could do everything itself. Mm. And that's where you got this power of opening up a system to allow for participation. And if you think about a traditional kind of value chain, um, so think if you were going to build a car, you would design the car in some sort of a design center and you might have you know, like a thousand engineers working on it or a thousand people. And then you would also have some distributed network of suppliers and they would do some of their thing, but it's all very tightly controlled. You know who's who. Um, I think some of the power of the platforms in, in order to create innovation that we've seen is because they're open enough that you don't have to know ahead of time who's going to work with you because people can come to the system, find the tools they need, find the ability to attach, um, build new things or, or get access to data or get access to new markets without it all being pre-specified because that's slow and cumbersome. So I think these things scale in ways that, that really make them quite new. Yeah. And I guess the scale is, 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 is related to the fact that, and their ability to scale is related to the software element of it um but I, i'm also interested to know other i think I, I did read some examples in your in your book uh, of companies that are not software companies but yet that are also platform companies if i, if I recall is john deere one well maybe? yeah john deere is actually a really fascinating one and and i forget there's a a, a european uh, kind of farm ag tech um, mm. consortium as well and and that's actually an important example because that's and because it'll 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 extend beyond just agriculture. Yeah. Um, For anyone that doesn't know John Deere, it's a, you correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, but it's it's agricultural machinery, which is why exactly I was, yeah, I was, tractors yeah. at the base, but combines and and so yeah. 
high it's it's essentially capital it's trucks that go on on land if you will it's it's high yeah. highly specialized capital equipment um and if you take that idea what they started with was collecting a lot of data and then that data is used to do one of two things you either increase the output so make the farm more productive for the same sort of fertilizer and machine hours and labor inputs or you can reduce the inputs sort of be more efficient with your seeds be more efficient with your with your fertilizers be more efficient with your labor so you get the same output um, for the for fewer inputs and and that's where a lot of companies kind of stop is they're like oh i know what to do with data i'll just instrument everything and then i'll i'll make what i'm already doing more efficient and mm -hmm. and so what we encourage people to do is to think a little bit more broadly and say well okay now you've got this data system how would you allow others to attach to that get access to it and then participate in order to create value either for the farmers or or for whoever else might end up attaching to that system um and then it truly becomes a platform because a lot of companies will sort of begin and stop with just using the data collection to increase productivity. Yeah. And, and another reason why it struck me as surprising is that maybe it was a misperception, but I'd always perceived the agricultural industry to be a relatively conservative one. And would it be, would it be fair to say that most platforms seem to have evolved in contexts which are sort of not particularly conservative or, or is that a false, uh, perception um i think they've evolved in contexts that um the outputs were more easily digitized so think software think media and entertainment and now what we're seeing is sort of the extension of those business models um into more the combination of the physical and the digital mm. and, and so i think there's kind of a natural progression and this ag, so yeah, you might call it a conservative industry, but I also think because it's it's kind of low volume in the sense that the output of the machines, the number of machines is relatively few compared mm. to, you know, uh, like an iPhone or something, which is, is quite high volume. Um, and they're quite expensive. Uh, mm. So I think there are a number of things that, and so the, and the assets last a long time. And so when you have those combinations of factors, you're likely to see the pace of change be a bit slower. Gotcha, okay. Um, let's move on, if that's okay, to um, another um, sort of property of, of uh, platforms, um, and that is um, defensibility. So it, it, what is it that makes a platform defensible and, and, and are platforms typically more defensible than other businesses? Well, so the defensibility comes from a few things. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of, a lot of scrutiny on those, but, but primarily it's, if you think about network effects, um, as you get large, what you're doing in terms of service provision becomes more valuable. And so then to get a successful entrant to come and compete with that, they have to um, either provide so much value themselves that they peel users off or mm. somehow encourage large numbers of users to simultaneously defect from platform A over to platform B. That turns out to be a really hard problem. And absent some sort of mistake mm. by the, the larger platform where they screw up in some kind of fundamental way and drive users off, um, that's not super likely. And so the, the challenge for a competitor is how do I build a mousetrap that's compelling enough that it can overcome, you know, not only the other guy's mousetrap or the other company's mousetrap, but also the value that all their users bring. So yeah. it's a tough competition game. And then if you've got switching costs, um, that makes it even harder. So if, 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 if sort of users are heavily invested, especially on the industrial side, you're, you're likely to see this in sort of one system, um, it could be very expensive for them to switch over to another one. And those those make the platforms more defensible. Gotcha. Um, however, it does seem that occasionally it seems to happen either by mistake or design. I'm particularly thinking of this fascinating example of um, what's happening with search and Amazon and Google. And can you say something to us about that? It's really an interesting phenomenon. It really is. And uh, actually, I think 
some of what we learned from that would come from Alibaba because mm. they actually had a decision to make early in their career as to whether or not to allow external search engines to get into their system. And they actually chose to exclude that, which meant that early um, that was kind of life or death for them because they were missing traffic that would have been driven in particular by a system like Baidu. Um, and so it's not surprising now that we're, we're seeing search in the really big systems, as you say, as, as Amazon, um, as being kind of a source of value add um, that they would want to control internally. Uh, but um, is another element of it that um, most of Google revenue comes from the the, the commercial side of, of, of commercial advertising, and yeah. uh, not, uh, as it were, the rest of search, which is non-commercial, is parasitic on the <laughs> uh, on the sort of commercial side in order to in order to sort of fund it. Well, you know, that's a, it's an interesting thing because the rest of search is also training all of the AI and the machine learning. Mm -hmm that a company like Google uh, deploys to do better targeting of its own advertising. So, uh, and it brings the users to the table. So I, I think you can't have one without the other right? Uh, in terms of that, that business. Something like 50% of, of searches for a product now begin on Amazon, is that right? Um, yeah, I've heard numbers like that. And early on, I don't know if it's still true, but, um, even within the Google system, something like half of search was commercially or, um, you know, oriented. Yeah. So there was significant interest in, in commercial search from the user point of view. Gotcha. Okay. And that brings us on to a further sort of related uh, question of um, uh, how do you how do you monetize a platform? Typically, how do you how do you get revenue? Yeah, and that's uh, so when you get into the business models, that's you'll see quite a bit of variation. Um, and that matters a lot to understand that variation because if you're kind of a traditional company trying to figure out how to use or deal with the platform, you need to understand those business models as well. Mm -hmm. We Some archetypes are you've got, and you've already spoken about the advertiser supported networks like a Google. Mm -hmm. And that's that's pretty simple. I mean, you, you provide some service of value to the end user who is a potential consumer. So say you and me. In Google's case, it's search, um, or it could be their applications suite, like Google Docs or or Sheets. But search is kind of the uh, the, the clearest one. Um, and then you monetize through placing advertisements and highly targeted, and they've gotten mm -hmm. sort of very good at that and understanding what the likely convert rates are. And then you run auctions on search terms. All right, and that's probably the, the overwhelming majority of their revenue. Um, another one would be sort of fixed fees to get access to another side. And so that would be a LinkedIn type of model where um, you would charge uh, either the end users themselves. So if you wanna use kind of a premium version of LinkedIn that, that lets you have better analytics and see who's searching for you, then they're happy to monetize, but really it's on the other side of the market. So for a, sort of it's a, a big um, placement firm that allows for for targeted searches for employees. Um, and that that's essentially getting access to one side of the market um, and for pay. So it's not quite advertising, but it's in the same sort of vein. Um, and then the other archetypal archetype business model would just be flat out transaction, like running a market. And then you would take a cut of the transaction, either a fixed cut, you know, you sold something, you pay me a dollar or a percentage cut. You sold something, you pay me Two percent, you pay me thirty percent, whatever you know the the particular market segment is, and gotcha. it's right there. Yeah. So Airbnb sort of uh, style. Yeah, Airbnb, um, Uber does the same thing. eBay does the same thing. Yeah. Uh, Amazon Marketplace does the same thing. There so, are tons and tons of those market style. Open Table, if you use any reservation systems, does the same thing. And a couple of, of great examples of, of people that are doing it right. It's not always that easy to get right first time. I, I think I, I heard you talk about a, an interesting example with Adobe in there. Oh, yeah. I mean, they, they taught us a lot. And that was early on in, in figuring out who to charge. So can you walk uh, us through that a little bit? Yeah, sure. So, really 
It's fascinating example because if you think about the software industry, they were very used to charging f pretty high prices, frankly. I mean, if you go back to Lotus 1, 2, 3 and, and the spreadsheets, you, know, you bought a pile of disks for something like $500. And the idea that somebody would pay $500 now for a spreadsheet program that Google gives away for free is, is kind of laughable. But at the time, um, that was the environment. And so Adobe created their PDF portable document format system. And then Acrobat was the system that you could create PDFs with. This is before they embedded themselves into operating systems. And then Acrobat Reader was the, the reading system. And if you think about that old pricing model, it's like, well, of course, end users are going to pay because they always used to. Mm. And so they charged something like $50 for the reader and discovered nobody wanted it. And for lots of reasons, there wasn't much to consume. There were only a few PDF documents and there just wasn't that much value for an end user. And so they ran an experiment by, as I understand it, um, within the America Online environment. So this was back in the 90s, it's a long time ago. And they just gave it away for free to anybody who had an America Online subscription, you could download it. And they discovered that all of a sudden, the demand for the full price, something like $300 writer product, went way up. Mm -hmm. Because now all of a sudden, it made sense to buy the writer because you could easily produce documents that people could read for free. And that they, they kind of backed into how to do two-sided network pricing. So, yeah, so, so by, yeah, by making what, a, a component free, they actually exactly. increased the attractiveness of it. Well, and, and that's the thing that we really had to work out. We being kind of um, business theorists and economists had to understand in, a, in an environment of network effects, um, it may not be efficient to charge both sides of a market um, a price that's above zero because you might be destroying value by... Uh, kind of discouraging consumption, which would create network effects. And so if you take those, lots of words for it, network effects, spillovers, um, and they can be indirect or cross-side, which means mediating different types of users, or they can be same-side mediating users that look like one another. Um, and, and there's a whole kind of explosion of theory from, let's say, the early 2000s. Uh, that really worked that out. We were fortunate enough to have one of the the early sort of papers on that um, and a couple of other of their teams. Um, but that was an important change because it kind of overturned a lot of a lot of what people thought they knew about how to do pricing. Gotcha. Um, I don't want I, I, this, this is such interesting examples, but I, I, I'm conscious of time and I, I am keen that we at least get a chance to talk a little bit about healthcare, which is um, All right. where I work. And, <laughs> and, and, and I understand it where you started your career in, in GE uh, healthcare, was it? Yeah. What's happening with platforms in healthcare? You know, are they already here? Are they not coming? And if not, why not? And, and if they will, when? Yeah, so um, multiple perspectives on that. So some people will tell you that uh, it's so fragmented and the players are so entrenched um, and the regulatory hurdles are so high that it's going to be a very long time. Um, others say that uh, we're kind of uh, on the cusp of a revolution. Um, mm -hmm. And so I think it, it kind of depends at what level. The unregulated stuff like, you know, if you instrument yourself with a Fitbit or something, that's pretty easy to do. But I, that doesn't really drive the costs down. I think I think kind of the where people are really hoping to get is um, interoperability with electronic medical record systems, electronic healthcare record systems, whatever you want to call it. Um, and 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 I think that will happen um, in the U.S. Anyway, there have been some regulations that are designed to force it um, and have these sort of open fire API standards that allow for interoperability. There have been some sort of COVID-related things that have both accelerated it and and hindered it. The acceleration is all of a sudden everybody is doing a lot of telemedicine, and we've discovered that for many applications, that's actually pretty effective. And by we, I mean the practitioners, not me personally, but mm -hmm. as an observer. 
Um, but on the other hand, you it's sort of hard to go back and invest in core technology right now when everybody's kind of dealing with with um, the, the pandemic and, and sort of the, the disruption that that implies. Uh, but I do think we're opening the space for more open s architectures, more open systems that would allow for more interoperability. And, and that can only sort of, that's very likely to lead to some sort of an open platform model. And by mm -hmm. open, I mean open enough in the sense that I could get access to that system as um, a service provider, create new services that um, would either directly benefit patients or that doctors would use um, in order to assist them in the provision of services. Gotcha. Um, there's, there are some initiatives like um, Open EHR. Have you yeah. come across that? To, to... I, I haven't, but even the big firms like Epic in the US, I mean, they're, they're, they talk about it. They're not there yet, but I would expect that this is on their roadmap because I don't think they can stop it. And right. Uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to ask you. There are companies like Cerner and Epic. Uh, Epic, sorry, are they are they are they going to facilitate this, or are, are they at the moment are they inhibiting well, it? Well, yeah, I mean, lots of others will have sort of more detail on this, but you wouldn't say that it's been a great story to date mm -hmm. in terms of interoperability, and they've been primarily um, sort of playing an enterprise software game. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of the old model where you you kind of back into a, a, a site with a bunch of servers and you know a couple of semis full of stuff, highly customized, um, huge deployment costs, um, and that's kind of an old model. I mean, you know, if you, that's sort of the the traditional old SAP style model um, when we first saw a lot of the kind of integrated manufacturing solutions. You know, what you would expect is a lighter weight cloud-based model um, so that you don't have to maintain all of that technology, but also that means continuous kind of upgrades invisibly to the software so you don't have to do all of this kind of huge customization. Um, so you'd expect to see that because the rest of the world is going that way and it's going to be really hard to prevent that even in healthcare. Gotcha. Yeah. And I and I guess it, it, it we've mentioned the word regulation uh, in in relation to, to several things. Um, I guess I've always uh, felt that regulation has, on average, hindered the development of platform style systems. But you seem to suggest uh, from your previous comments that actually recently regulation has been used to force uh, uh, large players um, to open up their systems to more platform like uh, approaches. Is that is that well, and it's not even, yeah, to, I'd say, open up in ways that will facilitate and make platforms possible. And so, like, an analog might be the European Payment Services Directive 2, which oh, yeah. has forced opening um, in the banking system that yeah. then allows for external parties to get, ac with, with a, a consumer's permission, get access to their accounts and then you can take action on those accounts, um, even if it's not the issuing bank that owns that relationship. And so then that's had the effect of making the banks think carefully about where the value add is. Do mm -hmm. I really have to sell a deposit product, which doesn't have a very high margin, or am I better off trying to control the relationship with the end user, provide them a good experience, and then just facilitate other companies to come in and provide services um, using my technology. So it kind of flips the story that says, yeah. do I want to hold them off or do I want to invite them in? Because by inviting them in, I make it more likely that my customer stays with me. And so that's where regulation can kind of flip the story that says this is going to come anyway. Um, mm -hmm. So how do you want to deal with it? So I think we could see the same thing happen in the healthcare space. Some really interesting analogies uh, between finance and healthcare with the security issues and so forth. Well, Jeff, exactly that, and they're really highly regulated. So, yeah. Jeff, um, 
Um, sadly, we have come to the end of our uh, uh, allotted uh, 30 minutes. I know you're a, a busy man. Thank you so much for taking the time to chat to us. Uh, these are issues that we're uh, wrangling with uh, in my own company at the moment. So it's it's just uh, such a privilege to have uh, half an hour with uh, someone of, of your experience and expertise. So thanks so much. And, um, and uh, yeah, hope to catch right. up soon. Well, thank you for having me and uh, really enjoyed it. Cheers. Bye now. Bye. -bye.